Episode 13, Health and Safety Gone Mad. I didn't know it until just before we landed in Delhi yesterday, but apparently we are going to another triangle. However, our brilliant guide assures me that it is called the Rajasthan Triangle, but in a good way, we will be starting with the angle on the eastern end of the hypotenuse in the pink city of Jaipur. Some tourist destinations have a bad reputation. They, whoever they are, proclaim that the British are standoffish, that Parisians are rude, that the Romans are con men, the Bulgarians larcenous. These are most definitely not my opinions, not even after a Parisian waiter spat on our tip, which he presumably thought was inadequate, and we did get scammed twice on a three-day mini-break in Rome. 40 euros for a taxi ride round the corner, and the old leather jacket for the sick brother in hospital routine expertly played, although the performance was definitely not worth the 15 euros we gave him. And then there was the time we returned to our tents in a Sofia campsite to find they had been gutted, as we were too. At least the nice people in the camp shop helped us buy replacements for the stolen equipment, even if some of the items did look rather familiar, and then there was, sorry, I'm not making my point very well, am I? What I'm trying to say is that racial and national stereotyping is unhelpful and wrong. That's to say it's always unhelpful and it's also wrong most of the time, but there are some wildly flailing generalizations which do occasionally hit the mark. For instance, friends returning from Australia agree that all the wildlife really is trying to kill you. Well, all I can say is welcome to India, where inanimate objects are out to get you too. My employer, the national charity Age UK, has got everything right which has made bitchy gossip around the tea and pretty well obsolete. That means that I have had to find alternative ways of letting off steam, as has the urn, so I have been forced to turn to my previous employers for examples of bad practice. Fortunately, I am spoiled for choice, as the chief executives and head teachers I have worked under have been a mixed sponge. Altogether, there have been eight of them, among them some inspiring people like my current boss. But three rotten apples in a barrel of eight is not a good ratio, which leads me to wonder whether I may have slipped into my job interviews the question, oh, by the way, is your boss an immoral, paranoid serial embezzler? The easiest way to judge the culture of an organization is by its attitude towards human resources and towards staff training in particular. One of my previous employers had the good manners to fulfill its obligation to in-service education, but treated it as a tick-box exercise. They handed over the responsibility to a training company who did a good job with the computer graphics but made a complete gov up of the content except for one topic, which is usually the most resentment-inducing of them all health and safety at work. They had obviously spent the whole budget on this one module. The idea wasn't even that original, but I still think it was worth every penny. We were presented with a series of rather crowded cartoons, each one depicting a different type of work setting. All you had to do was list the numbers in the cartoon where a breach of safety regulations was taking place and explain in each case what the problem was. What made all this memorable was the sheer number of transgressions per screenful. The longer you looked, the more dangerous the activities became, and it seemed like the designers had given their imaginations free reign. So, next to a rather obvious sketch of someone cleaning a tiled floor with a wet mop, but without the little yellow warning cones, a carpenter appeared to be sawing his own arm off. 
the ensuing blood making another slip hazard. Danger number four involved a man painting a wall while standing, but I fear not for long, on a rickety plank supported by one and a half step ladders, which in turn rested on what looked like a handful of pebbles, only the most observant would have spotted a tiny number 12 directly underneath the painter next to which stood an incongruous metal spike, if he runny moss bosch had been into painting by numbers. I am sure he would have produced something like this. It is tempting to think that whoever designed this corner of India must have been thinking on similar lines, but it soon becomes obvious that no one person or deity could possibly claim responsibility for this chaotic mess. It is a testament to the resilience and ingenuity of the population that anyone lives to fight another day. Take the roads for instance, Britain is fortunate enough to have a fair number of citizens who grew up in the Indian subcontinent, and like generations of immigrants before them, the overwhelming majority have adapted to their new home. This includes following the rules of the road, and even the people who started their driving career in India are indistinguishable in their behaviour on the roads from everyone else including their own British-born offspring. It's a matter of fitting in of going with the traffic flow, people do it automatically, without thinking. In Britain they drive sedately and defensively, in India they drive like, like their pants are on fire. That doesn't quite do Indian driving justice, perhaps this will. Question, in India, do they drive on the left or the right? Answer, yes. This section of dual carriageway is as good an example as any. I know most of you have had your eyes closed for some time, but nobody's asleep. Just sit back, open your eyes and trust our excellent driver. Yes, we're on the right side of the road, the left. Some of the lorry drivers going in the other direction have decided that their carriageway is too bumpy, with some justification, as the potholes on that side are just on the cusp of becoming sinkholes, so they have made the decision to share our side of the road with us, without benefit of road signs or cones of course, the situation then takes on its own air of permanence. Because the central reservation is made up of large concrete blocks, so the lorries will be on the wrong side for another 30 miles, at which point they enter the outskirts of the next town, where the central reservation disappears and all hell breaks loose as they merge with the slightly more law-abiding traffic from the left carriageway. So our lanes have become a two-way road which would be just about okay if the drivers going in our direction didn't insist on still treating the right-hand lane as ours, reserved for overtaking. The presence of looming lorries notwithstanding, there ensues a game of chicken, worthy of any tandoori. The question is, who will blink first, but this is India, and the answer is neither of them. At the very last second, the car going our way darts back in, driver and passengers saved from a do-it-yourself cremation for at least the next 15 minutes, and then it starts to get really hairy, as if the lorry driver changing a tire in the left-hand lane on our right, if you see what I mean weren't enough, there's the mayhem going on to our left to consider. What passes for the hard shoulder will not be of any use as a refuge from the approaching Carmageddon, it has enough troubles of its own. For a start, there is the usual two-way jostle of pedestrians. In the cities, these moving throngs are remarkable. But out here in the countryside, they're nothing short of jaw-dropping. Where are all these people going? It is as if the whole of India's billion-plus population were on the move. It's miles to the nearest town and it's silly degrees in the shade of which there is none. And then there's the camels and the other beasts of burden, 
the cyclists go to the bikers and the sidecars, but along all this jostling counterflow, there are cars coming towards us on our left, on our hard shoulder. These rogue vehicles are here for a reason. Whoever built this road didn't leave a gap in the central reservation for right turners, leaving them to take their chances in the hard shoulder lottery. Together with the trucks hurtling towards us in our overtaking lane, they have made us into the filling of their traffic jam sandwich. But this isn't the main problem, that can be summed up in the two words painted on the back of every lorry and van, horn please. It's certainly not a lack of driving skill which makes these roads dangerous, and there are quite a few like our driver, who takes it all in his stride and steers us stoically on a safe course through the raging rapids. No, the real threat is intimately connected to the Indian's love of hooting. Drivers in Britain use their horns as little as possible, and then mostly in anger. The idea of inviting fellow road users to hoot is completely alien to us. But here in the subcontinent, it serves a vital purpose. If you approach a vehicle, particularly a commercial vehicle, you have to announce your presence and probably also your intention to overtake. And one little toot is not enough. It has to be the full Pavarotti wire because the driver in front is asleep, or at least dozing, and certainly not looking where he's going. The heat and the warm breeze coming through the open windows are gently so porific, and the temptation to join the moving siesta is hard to resist. We can only hope they realize when it's time to wake up and smell the diesel, and even those who have resisted the urge to nap can't be expected to know what's coming up behind. The vehicle's mirrors are used solely as somewhere to hang ornaments. Question, how many people can you fit on an Indian bus? Answer, two more. With such a huge population, it would be remarkable if some of India's transport system were not crowded, but overcrowding seems to act as a spur to people's ingenuity and bravado. I can understand that some passengers are keen to escape the stifling heat of the inside of their sardine tin bus with its prison barred windows. Are the bars there to deter yet more people from joining the magical misery ride, or are they trying to stop passengers escaping from this moving Alka transport? But taking to the roof does seem a bit extreme. Spurred on by their train surfing compatriots, they climb up to the cooler and fresher air and lean into the breeze. Doing their best titanic impressions and hoping the bus doesn't break suddenly. That's right, the passengers on the top deck of the speeding single decker are all standing and some are holding cigarettes, which appear to be smoking themselves. None are sitting for these men, and they are all men. Sitting is for wimps. They give the impression that you are only welcome up here if you're at home to Captain Deathwish, and a quick look around will yield numerous examples of the insane optimism of our fellow road users. Why make three hot and dusty journeys when you can load your car to the gunnels, open the hatch and let everything scrape along behind, occasionally giving off sparks or a shower of wood shards? The logic seems to go. This journey is a bit risky so we'd better drive extra fast to make sure it doesn't last too long. But the real Hiran Nemus Bosch peril by numbers chart is over there in that heaving mass of humanity on the hard shoulder. There will be no plaintive cries of are we there yet on this trip. For our own health and safety muck it, we are definitely already there. So who will give us the first example of someone over there who is living on borrowed time? What was that? Oh, I see him, the man riding the Honda 50 that is probably twice his age. Yes, he is taking a risk with one ten-year-old daughter sitting in front of him as he tries to reach over her head to steer the motorbike. 
with twin sister clinging onto her father's rucksack while hovering over the back wheel. You're right, I didn't see the toddler sandwiched between her and dad's backpack, that puts your score up to 3 out of 5 on the dicing with death scale. If you had managed to keep your eyes open on our admittedly scary journey through the Delhi shanties, you would have encountered a genuine five-pointer, a similar motorcycle with nine people and a dog aboard, including four generations, great-grandma, then grandma and grandpa, each holding a toddler, with mum driving an elder son hanging onto the handlebars with one hand and the dog's colour with the other, sorry, I nearly forgot the two babies in the wire shopping basket up front, but the three-seater tuk-tuk you pointed out is more like it, I can count 16 passengers, which would score 4.5 on the dicing with death scale, and no, that hedge isn't moving, the mass of vegetation has a cod-chewing head just peeking out of the front, and if you look carefully, you can make out for a camel's feet, question, why are those two women in stunningly bright saris sitting in the middle of the road? Answer, good question. The sign says welcome to Rajasthan, and first impressions are favorable. It seems so vibrant and colorful, hinting at the treasures that await us. But what is that pink and yellow obstacle ahead? It turns out they are road workers and their astonishingly bright saris fulfill not only the function of the mundane high-vis jacket, but they also have to stand in for the missing warning signs and cones. As the traffic swerves and scrapes past, the two women calmly continue their conversation, occasionally scooping a handful of tar straight from the tar burner and patting it down into the nearest pothole, I don't know what is the greater mystery, how they managed to avoid burning their hands, or why they bothered doing a repair job that would only last a few weeks. I don't have the answers to either question, but I suspect they have something to do with poverty. This hotel has seen better days, as have the staff, their elaborate white uniforms, well, mostly white match the spotty tablecloths and bedsheets. After the spectacular sights and frenetic atmosphere of Jaipur and the breathtaking splendor of Jodhpur, the relative peace of Bacon Air is welcome. Our accommodation is pretty awesome too, in that our three-room suite is grand in scale and the wiring is bloody scary. The electrical wires protruding several inches from the walls have a variety of switches and sockets hanging from them, each strand marked with one of six colors, six for a country with so many gods, I suppose it is fitting that you can meet your maker with the flick of a switch. And as for the tradesmen, I would recommend choosing them with care, it is clear that, in this country, it's possible to be both a cowboy and an Indian. But we must move on to our next experience, and sitting here by the pool of a five-star hotel with this fabulous view of the walled city of Jai Samer, it is hard to think of anything negative. We have got here safely and we have even managed to avoid any sign of an upset stomach whereas the independent tourists have to be careful not to get the raging trots worse than Jeremy Corbyn's fan club. For that, and for so much else, we have our guide to thank. When we arrive at a restaurant, he goes straight into the kitchen and makes sure he is happy with the food and the hygiene. However, he does not eat with us and I have assumed this has something to do with him being a devout Hindu, to be honest. I thought it was a caste thing, but I am probably just showing my ignorance. Yesterday, we came down early for breakfast, our guide came over and cheerfully wished Brenda and me a good morning, then he disappeared into the kitchen, we were surprised when he came out soon after and asked if he could sit down with the two of us, he said that this hotel has the best food, I asked him what he had ordered for himself. The vegetable curry parata was apparently not on the menu, but he asked if I would like one.
the best decision of my food-eating life, which is now sadly over. To this day I cannot explain how such humble ingredients could be made into something that danced on my tongue like a multitude of angels, with a few spicy hot devils thrown in for good measure. I hope you'll agree that the food has been fine so far, but mostly not up to the standard of Indian cuisine in Birmingham or London. The only complaints so far come from the meat eaters. That's not surprising in a country where the vast majority of the population are vegetarians, but it has probably more to do with the fact that they don't seem to use meat from animals until they have died of old age. Of all the wonderful sights Rajasthan has to offer, this is my favorite, even the view of the blue town from the citadel of Jodhpur is surpassed by our first encounter with the desert city of Jai Samer. Later today, we will amble through the narrow streets of this ancient fortress town, dodging the cows and admiring the giant swastikas commemorating weddings and births. But first let's take in the big picture. Everyone says it looks like a sand castle on a sandy beach, and that is basically what it is. Substitute the Great Thar Desert for the ocean and the local sandstone for the beach and you have just about got it. This is a good metaphor for this whole region, imposing and harmonious from a distance, but closer up well, that's a slightly different story, blending in with the landscape lends it a harmonious beauty, but the sandstone is more like sand than stone, the city's walls and houses are made of the same crumbling earth as the imposing rock it is perched on, and from the car park down here, you can see the biggest source of danger, it's water, it may not rain much in these parts, but the houses up top have mains water, and here you can see the damage done from previous small leaks, it is not hard to imagine the effects of a major pipe burst, the problem is not that sand and water don't mix, it's that they mix too well, but the metaphor doesn't end there. We need to factor in the ingenuity and resilience of the city's inhabitants. They have been living on the ragged edge for many generations, and I would not be surprised if their precarious lifestyle lasted for many centuries more. So far, our journey has highlighted more than the resourcefulness of our hosts and the closeness of death. Every city can boast a string of fabulously rich Maharajas who are the perfect counterpoint to their dirt poor subjects, the extravagance of their palaces, the gold and precious stones seem to scream wealth, but all this opulence masks the most important luxury of them all, and again, it's water. People even richer than any Maharaja namely the Mughal emperors, learn the hard way how vital a reliable source of water is in this hut and dry land. The ruins of their abandoned would-be capital Fatapur Sikri are a reminder of a harsh fact of life, a reminder none of the local despots needed. We Europeans, I'm hoping the British still qualify, would build a reservoir or sink a well if we needed more drinking water, but for the people in this parched area, Something different was required, to slake the thirst of a multitude, a bucket and a winch wouldn't really do it, with such huge demand and a limitless supply of heavy lifters, one typically ingenious solution was that miracle of geometry known as the step well, it takes a while to understand what you're looking at, and then it becomes clear, a big hole in the ground with lots of water at the bottom, with all the walls covered with short flights of steps, and that means hundreds of people could use the well at the same time. But I think the final word on life, the universe and health and safety should go to our Indian hosts. They clearly believe that spiritual safety is more important than the physical kind. A normally level-headed driver has built a little shrine on the flat-top dashboard of the minibus, he then lights three candles and sets off, our guide makes no effort to stop him or to grab hold of the sliding candles, it's Diwali, and we have our dash shrine, nothing bad can happen to us, 
We even stop and wait politely so that the little boy sitting in the middle of the road can light the firework rocket he is holding. Mission accomplished. He waves and throws the live firecracker under the boss. We are no longer in Rajasthan. We are further south in Udaipur on this auspicious night. We have a table booked and we're sitting on a terrace beautifully situated between the Maharana's palace and the ultimate status symbol, a lake, and this one is large enough to have an island with another palace on it. We are told that the lake and island feature in a James Bond film called Pussy Never Dies. Or some such nonsense. Good food, good company, great view. What could possibly top this? The Prince's Diwali fireworks. That's what a spectacular assault on the senses. So indeed, one rocket fails to soar into the sky. And soon after we see a waiter running between the tables, holding a wildly burning tablecloth, as I said, so Indian.